Hello, I'm Mike Baselli, and this is episode number two of Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli. In this episode, I'm excited to have Dr. Benjamin Miller from Wellbeing Trust on the podcast as we discuss mental well-being in our nation and communities. We even discuss the love of sushi, the cowbell, and the guitar in a very important question Dr. Miller asked of all of us toward the end of the podcast. Welcome to Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli, where we highlight and speak with the innovators, the game changers, and the pioneers who are deeply passionate and relentless in solving the problems our world is facing today. This is your opportunity to connect with and learn from these leaders and to support them on their mission. Perhaps they will soon be hearing your story as well. This is Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli. I look forward to having you on this journey with us. It's time to dive into episode number two with Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli. I'm excited to have our first guest on the podcast, Dr. Benjamin Miller, Chief Strategy Officer at Wellbeing Trust. Let me give a little bit of context of why I'm so excited to have Dr. Miller here today and what Wellbeing Trust is up to. Wellbeing Trust is a national foundation dedicated to advancing a vision of a nation where everyone is well in mental, social, and spiritual health. Launched by Providence St. Joseph in 2016 as an independent 501c3 public charity with an initial seed endowment of $100 million, plus an additional $30 million to be invested in California from 2017 to 2019, Wellbeing Trust is now investing in approaches that have the potential to model the way forward. Wellbeing Trust was created to advance clinical, community, and cultural change, to transform the health of the nation and improve well-being for everyone. Welcome, Dr. Miller. We're so glad to have you here. Thanks, Mike. Tell a little bit uh, b- about your backstory, and then we'll get into some icebreaking as well. Yeah, so I'm a clinical psychologist by training, but if you really want to know who I am, I'm a musician and an artist. Oh, you know, what, my passions, what drives me is making music and painting things on paper, on walls, wherever I can. Uh, I apply that to my work in health policy. How can you be creative? How can you create something that hasn't been created before? So I think I'm a musician first and then a health policy wonk second. So I'm really good at the cowbell. Yeah. What's your instrument? I'm a guitarist. Okay. I I started when I was 12 not knowing how to play the guitar, but I had one. And so anybody that thinks they can play the guitar at 12 years old probably can't, except for those, you know, prodigies on YouTube. So I was the guy that sounded really bad, but I was passionate about it. I I like it. it. I like it. And and it's obviously carrying over in today's work at Wellbeing Trust, which we're going to dive into as well. Mm -hmm. Well, before we dive in into that and a little bit more of your backstory and, and what you're up to at Wellbeing Trust, I, I always want our audience to get to know you personally. So we're going to have a quick icebreaker session. You're going to choose one of three questions. What is your favorite place on earth you visited and why? What is your favorite meal and why? Or what is one thing you love to do besides your pioneering passions and why? Okay. Go ahead and select one. All right. I'm going with the middle here. Favorite meal. I think hands down this is Sushi. Okay. Sushi represents complexity and simplicity simultaneously. You can do hot and you're cold. You can do yin and yang. It's perfect meal. I love it. I could eat sushi every day for every meal. Sushi. All right. Have you, have you been to Japan? I have not. My 11-year-old has been to China, but I have never been to Asia. Oh, wow. I was recently in Japan, and actually I'm going to highlight that in just a moment, and, and, and some epiphanies I had while over in Asia. But the sushi there is incredible. Um, it, when you can walk into a place and you don't see any English, yeah. you know you're in a good spot. Right. So <laughs> sushi it is. So let's back up a little bit. Let's talk about your current work. Let's also rewind the clock. How did you get to where you are today as a chief strategy officer of Wellbeing Trust? Mm-hmm. What prepared you for that role? And then we'll talk about what you guys are doing currently today and in the future. So maybe rewind the clock a little bit back for our um, listeners. Yeah, absolutely. So I fundamentally believe that it's always the individual in the context of family, family in the context of community. So if you want to know my journey, you have to look at me in the context of my family and then in my community. I grew up with politicians on one side of me and physicians on the other side of me. My father was really involved in health insurance back in the day when managed care was all the rage. I learned a lot about the business side of healthcare as well as the politics of healthcare pretty early on. I I remember being like nine or 10 years old, staying with my grandparents and putting up signs for my grandfather's reelection campaign in yards. 
knocking on the doors, you know, saying, hey, you should vote for my grandfather, having the mayor come over for lunch. It was just this common occurrence. I loved it. And I got so invigorated by being surrounded with folks that could make a difference. So that's kind of where I started. I loved the politics of it. I didn't always like, you know, going on the radio and listening to people kind of yammer about this and that. I, I didn't like that so much. But I loved the fact that you could be influential. So fast forward, when I graduated college, I didn't know what I was going to do. I went and taught school, and I taught in a special ed school. And this was a really special school, and this is in Chattanooga, Tennessee, where I'm from. Wow. And it was a school for kids that had what we called severe emotional disturbance, SED kids. These are kids that had been in a traditional school and had been kicked out from a behavioral issue. Maybe they had an IEP. They had something that kept them separate. And so this school was really to provide some type of assistance to them. In this school is where I made my decision to what I do today. I watched kids every day come to school that hadn't had a shower, hadn't eaten, had potentially been abused the night before, and I watched the impact that that had on their lives, and it, it changed me. It really did. Wow. I dreaded coming to work, not just because of how hard it was going to be to watch those kids suffer, but because those kids, they really oftentimes uh, acted out in ways that were troubling to me. Hmm. Um, they would get in fights for no reason. Uh, I remember vividly one child tried to jump out of the third floor window just because he was so upset. Mm. And I watched this and I realized like there has to be a better way for these kids. Like as a teacher, I could only do so much. I knew that I was providing stability, support, comfort, all those things, giving them a shower when they hadn't showered in the morning. I could take them to the basement and let the nurse take care of them, giving them school. I would bring extra food sometimes just wow. to give these kids an opportunity to eat. But I knew there had to be something different. So the, the principal of the, the school was a psychologist, and he said, hey, Miller, you want to change the system? you got to get more education. Hmm. you got to go out there and do something where you can literally come back here and make a difference in these kids' lives. He said, you should be a psychologist because they understand systems, they understand family. And I was like, okay, because I didn't know what else I was going to do. So I talked this over with my wife, and we just decided, let's go for broke. We applied to two graduate schools, got into one, and the rest is history for my education. So it's a long-winded story, but it actually, I think about this every day. Wow. So I've had the good fortune and privilege to stand on big stages, to meet with amazing people like yourself, and to travel the world, frankly, and learn. But I always go back to those moments where it was about those kids. And those kids who I, you know, I hope every day are still alive and have a chance, but if I'm truthful with myself, I realize that they probably didn't get that chance that I want other people to have. Let's unpack that just a little bit before we dive into to well-being trust, your current work, and what you're going to be doing future state for our country. So you go back to school. Uh, you earn that degree. Did you go and practice, or were you always more at an administrative and a policy level? Maybe uh, let's, let's talk about that sure. journey a bit. Yeah, so when you're getting your doctorate in clinical psychology, one of the things that they want to do is give you a diverse experience of clinical. So I could be in a prison, which I did for a year. I could be in a primary care practice, which I did, and I fell in love with it. And so most people, some will go the traditional route of I'm going to hang my shingle on a wall and be a private practitioner and do my own thing. I loved the pace of primary care. It's kind of like um, getting up to you know, your first major league at bat and hitting a home run. That feeling that you might get from that. That's what primary care was to me. Wow. It was like every day I was like, oh my gosh, something new. This is great. Like, wow, I'm just so energetic and on fire because you never knew who was going to come in the door. So my passions really were around primary care. And for the listeners that don't know, primary care is that place that you go. It's first, foremost, and fundamental. It's kind of the entry point for most people in healthcare. And in health policy, we spend a lot of time talking about coverage. But on the delivery side, primary care is really where it's at. That's where I started. So it was in the clinical space. Wow. And then after that, did you get into kind of more of the policy and the administrative side yeah. of, the, of the industry? Absolutely. And it was out of frustration that I got into the policy stuff because I realized that this integrated model of bringing mental health clinicians into primary care, it wasn't happening everywhere. And when you look at why, it was policies and financing, policy and financing, policy and financing. So I just started asking my mentors, who's addressing this? Who's going upstream and looking at why we're not sustaining it? And they said, well... I don't know anybody that really is. Hmm. So I took that on. I said, I want this to be what I make a difference in. I want to go and look at the policies, and I want to change them because they are so fractured and fragmented, just like the traditional delivery system is for treating mental health. I didn't want that. I didn't feel like it was right. And were you doing that before your time at Wellbeing Trust? Absolutely. And in what vehicle? Maybe share a little bit about that. Yeah, so um, I started most of my professional career at the University of Colorado. So um, for psychology, we go through this thing called an internship. Yep. But they won't give you a doctorate degree until you go through internship. So I did my internship here in Denver at the University of Colorado School of Medicine, and I fell in love with the faculty. I fell in love with the passion, the chair of the Department of Family Medicine, a good mentor, a friend of mine, Frank Degree. 
He said, you know what? Mental health and primary care are inseparable. Any attempt to separate the two leads to inferior care. Mm. So I did that for a year, and I learned from Frank, and I went away to Massachusetts for long enough. I had great mentoring there, too, from uh, Dr. Sandy Blunt, who still remains a good friend and mentor. But I had to get out. Um, My wife and I were too cold in New England. So we came back to Denver, and I got the chance to go back and work with Frank. And he said, hey, listen, why don't you just create programs, create things that are going to make a difference in people's lives? There was no pressure. There was nothing that said, Miller, you got to do these three things. He just said, create. And I did. And I did it for years. And I actually ended up creating the uh, Department of Family Medicine, which now became the University of Colorado School of Medicine, Farley Health Policy Center, which is the policy center for the University of Colorado School of Medicine. It's amazing. And it's uh, given me a chance and a platform to go out into, across the country and to learn from states, to learn from leaders, but to continue that mission that I started with of how to better integrate mental health and change the policy. Unbelievable. So we're going we're to dive in uh, to well-being trust here in just a moment, but there's a reason why I wanted you as our first guest on this show. So as uh, many of our listening community members know, earlier this year in 2019, I, I had the fortunate opportunity to take my first ever sabbatical. And you know, as a, a good friend of mine, that I had a wonderful time and a very heart-wrenching time as well because of the juxtaposition of what I experienced. Mm-hmm. On the front end of leaving my, for my sabbatical, a key community member here, uh, his daughter committed suicide. And then 24 hours after being back from my sabbatical, our neighbor also committed suicide. And the juxtaposition was here I was in Asia for a month and learning about myself and having so many creative ideas and thoughts about how am I going to continue to move this industry forward and mm-hmm. being so relaxed and just uh, you could just feel the stress washing off of you while being on a sabbatical. So that juxtaposition between what I just shared of these community members and here in, 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 in Denver versus that, that's why I wanted to have you on because I've now become so passionate around the mental well-being of our nation. Mm-hmm. We're at a crisis, Dr. Miller, um, and I see it every day uh, from the people you know, in civic groups, volunteer groups, people here at Catalyst on our, on our healthcare innovation campus mm-hmm. in Denver and beyond. Yeah. And we see the headlines as well. Uh, it is an absolute crisis, you know, and as, as well as I do. And so that's why I really wanted to have you on, Dr. Miller, to take this head on with this first podcast and to have our guests hear the incredible work that you and Wellbeing Trust are dedicating yourselves to. So with that, I, I just wanted to share that backstory of why I'm so fortunate to have you as our first guest. Well, well thanks, Mike. And it takes a lot of courage to share your story, obviously, and I appreciate that. I know it's hard. Even yeah. in talking about it, it's probably not very few weeks since from now, and you're still experiencing the, yeah. the pain of, and suffering. And unfortunately, too many people in America experience it that every day. We lost 151,000 lives to drug, alcohol, and suicide in 2017, wow. the highest number on record. Suicide is an epidemic. We're looking at people dying by suicide at rates that we've never seen. And the sad thing is, if you look at the demographics, are millennials. So, you know, if you think about who is impacted the most, it's oftentimes our millennials. And then if you look at the highest rate of increase in suicide, especially in certain states like Colorado, it's adolescents. And we're seeing this um, happen, and the trend is disturbing. And I think that what is lost in this conversation is the fact that we don't really know how to make sense of it. Hmm. You know, I think you just did a great job uh, describing that juxtaposition. But I think when, if you're out there and you're exposed to a trauma, it's your neighbor that died. It's somebody that you knew that overdosed on a drug. How do you respond to that? And what do we do as a nation in response to that? That's where we're failing. And I think it begins with conversations like this. Truthfully, the narrative around mental health and addiction in this country is so messed up. It's wrong. We've treated it as this thing that only happens to a certain number of people. It's not my neighbor. It's not my friend. It's not my coworker. It's not my family. It is. Absolutely it is. And until we realize that it's every one of us, then the narrative is broken. We're not going to see the change that we need. So let's share some good news. Yeah. What are you guys up to at Wellbeing Trust, and, and why are you so passionate? I'm, I, you know, before you answer the question, let me set the stage for our listening community. Dr. Benjamin Miller resides here at Catalyst, our healthcare innovation campus in downtown Denver, when he's not on the road. And he comes bounding into the building. It's an amazing the energy that he brings to this community. And we're so fortunate to have your leadership here. So give us a little bit about what Wellbeing Trust is up to and why you are so passionate on the daily yeah. to bring 
new awareness and opportunity to our nation and beyond? Well, your listeners may have experienced this in their life at some point in time. When you've got a great idea and you know you need funding to support that idea, well, working with Wellbeing Trust, I'm the guy that gets to support and fund those great ideas. Oh, wow. Being on the foundation side, the philanthropy side of innovation is freeing. I mean, I did this for years, right, Mike? I, I worked and I asked people for money all the time because I knew that we had something good to offer. Well, when I come, come to this side of the aisle and I get to see what it's like to give money away and to see innovators thrive when they just have a little bit of support, it's really worth, I mean, for me, it's worth doing what I'm doing. It brings me such joy and passion. So what are we doing? Well, we invest in five big areas, and these are probably not going to be lost on your listeners because they're pretty common sense stuff, but we have to do something around clinical, right? The way that we deliver care is still so fragmented. We've got to integrate. We've got to do something around community. The way that we address community health is it's we ignore it and we refer everybody off to healthcare. We don't do a lot back home to address rising housing prices, to look at how we can provide affordable, healthy foods or good transportation that doesn't take you through the bad part of town at night when you're by yourself. Okay, those are community conditions that lead to overall well-being. It's what you've done here with this building. You've tried to create a new kind of beacon of hope on the hill so that the community around you can be inspired by what you're trying to do here. Okay, we have to do something around community. The third is around policy and advocacy, which we've talked a little bit about. It's my passion. I mean, I believe that we have got to do something in this country, robustly do something around policy or else we're always going to be tinkering at the edges of, of innovation, and that's not sufficient to bring about change for mental health. The fourth is social engagement. How do we talk about it? How do we get on podcasts like today? And how do we share a new narrative around mental health? How do we influence what people are hearing around mental health so they're inspired and filled with hope instead of, like we were talking about earlier, being somewhat down in the dumps about how sad it is that people are dying more often than they should? And then the fourth, or fifth, excuse me, last but not least, is around learning and innovation. Hmm. All of this is for naught if we don't take away lessons that we've learned. And I realize that's so common sense, right? But we've got to figure out a way to learn from what didn't work, to accelerate the adoption of things that did work, and to give people, frankly, you know, new stories that they can say, I want to do that in my community. I heard about that in Jackson, Wyoming. I want to apply that here in Tampa, Florida. So before we dive in, we're going to unpack a little bit of that because I want to hear some actual real-world examples uh, that are inside those five buckets uh, and how they are impacting community across our nation. How the heck did you land here? How how did you how did you uh, you know arrive to Well Being Trust? By the way, headquartered in Oakland, California. How did you become the chief strategy officer for an incredible organization? Yeah. So when I was at University of Colorado, one of the things that I really um, appreciated the opportunity to do is to travel around and learn and listen. So I was invited to a meeting in San Francisco that was um, started and spearheaded by the current CEO of Well Being Trust, Tyler Norris. And it was a, a group of folks that, you know, some I knew, some I didn't know. And the whole focus of it was how can we think as a group about how to advance mental health and well-being in this nation? And I'll never forget this. I, there was folks in the room. There was uh, musicians, um, people that had record deals. There were DJs. There were people that represented hospital CEOs. And we broke out into little groups. Nobody really knew everybody. And so, you know, the egos were checked at the door. That's great. And we came up with the best ideas that we thought would help mental health and well-being. And then we pitched them. Hmm. Something you know a lot oh, about, yeah. right? And so we stood up in front of our peers and we pitched these ideas. And I remember feeling like, wow, this is going to be something. Like, if, if this organization that's starting is going to do half of what's being talked about here, I want to be a part of that. So I, I remember this. I came home, talked to my wife, and I was like, you know, I love my job. I love University of Colorado. I've got great friends and family. But there's something really interesting about this opportunity. And I said, what would it look like if we joined this startup? Because in essence, that's what it was, Mike. I mean, yes, we had the money, but it's a startup culture. Absolutely. And my wife looked at me, and she was like, I think this is a little risky. But you know what? Let's go big. And so we decided we were going to try it out. And that was two and a half years ago. Wow. And so I became the strategy officer because, you know, a couple of different things that are unique about our foundation. We're staffed with content experts. I mean, I can talk of mental health day in and day out. I know the policy side of things really well. But I also understand the importance of organizationally having a strategy to advance a goal and looking at the tactics that go into that. How do you create the mechanisms to be successful? How do you measure that? So I get to do both. It's funny. I, I, I describe this to people all the time. I have like five jobs. Mm -hmm. But one of those jobs is the organizational strategy lead. So I get to pull all the pieces together, making sure they align. The second part of the job is to be out there on the front lines talking to great folks like you, 
to really represent this new wave, this future of what mental health and well-being can be in the country. And I, oh, by the way, I just get to represent a national organization in doing so. You definitely are part of a startup if you're, if you're wearing five different hats, right? Uh, as I like to say, sometimes we have to be chief bottle washers as well. Uh, give us maybe two or three real-world examples that fall within those five buckets that you just outlined for us. Yeah. So I'll give you one from clinical first. Great. So we realize, a lot of folks across the country realize that the emergency department is one of the worst places to be seen or treated for a mental health or addiction problem. But yet, it's oftentimes the first place that we refer people to. You're in a crisis. Go to the emergency department. And, you know, I don't feel well. I, I think I, you know, I might take my life. Go to the emergency department. And the emergency departments are poorly equipped to manage this. Now, don't get me wrong. They're staffed with amazingly competent individuals. But when they're trying to take care of a trauma that happened from a car accident and then deal with someone who's, deal, who's addressing all kinds of emotional issues in their life, it's really hard for them to prioritize that and say, you're number one. So we got together with the Institute for Healthcare Improvement, Don Berwick's group out of, um, out of Massachusetts, and we said, how can we go into the emergency departments and improve the quality of care? But wait for it, Mike. Not just do a better job in the emergency department, go upstream. So we called it ED and up. Hmm. So we want to know, how could we have prevented those people from showing up in the emergency in the department in the first place. place? Yeah. So we got together with a bunch of health systems, and we're in year three of learning from each other. Wow. That's a great example. The second one, um, let's go give you one from policy. This is my passion. So when we were talking about those deaths that have happened prematurely to drug, alcohol, and suicide, we call those the deaths of despair, right? People that have lost hope, that have gone from, you know, having this fulfilled life to all of a sudden, I don't really feel like I've got anything to live for. And we recognize that there is over 60 evidence-based practices and policies that could be put into community that would help with those deaths of despair. Looking at issues of loneliness, isolation, figuring out more robust ways to provide integrated services in schools. All of these things we put into a report called Pain in the Nation. If your listeners want to go check it out, paininthenation.org. That was one of the first things that we did as a foundation. And it was, it was foundational hmm. because it gave us this amazing platform to build off of. And even today, two years later, I'm still using these reports with updated data all the time to talk about the importance of change in policy. Another example in the social d- domain. So we've actually, in a couple of weeks, we're going to be launching a new program, which I'm really excited for your listeners, and we'll make sure we share all this stuff. But uh, we've partnered with Facebook to put out a curriculum for schools on how they can better address mental health. Wow. Now, there's good curriculum out there, and you know, sometimes you've got to pay for it, sometimes it takes too long. We wanted to create a one-hour curriculum that was free that we could give to every school in the nation so that both the teachers and the students knew how to talk about these issues better. Can you imagine what a game changer that is? If you and I, going up through high school, if we had had an opportunity to learn about mental health, do you think our country would be in the place that it is now? I don't know. Probably not. But we believe that you have to socially engage, and that's one mechanism. Where does Facebook come into play with that? Yeah, so Facebook, that's interesting. It's a longer story. So Facebook was really um, acutely aware that they needed to put out good materials on mental health. So they talked to partners of ours, we talked to them, and they said, hey, listen, let's do this together. So we're going to be launching this in uh, the end of month of September, where we put out that curriculum, and Facebook's going to use that exclusively, well, not exclusively, because it'll be for everybody, but they'll be promoting that through their, uh, their platform. That's exciting. So just a couple quick questions for you. Um, one that uh, continues to worry me is that for the first time since World War II, life expect- expectancy in our nation has declined. Mm-hmm. Some uh, main causes are alcoholism and drug abuse. Mm -hmm. How much of this is also related to the mental well-being of our citizens? Is it all interrelated? What what does that look like? Yeah, I do think it's all interrelated, and I'm glad you brought that up. I mean, life expectancy has been increasing for decades until all of a sudden it wasn't. And we had, you know, if you look at The Economist, if you look at some of the folks that were studying these data, they were scratching their heads saying, okay, something's off here. And we realized it's these deaths of despair. And so if you look at the evidence, and I would really encourage your, your listeners to go and look at, um, you know, Anne Case and Angus Deaton. This was the seminal paper that talked about deaths of despair. And these are two economists that were studying the data and said, okay, here's the trends that we're seeing. And wait a minute. Oh, it's going in the wrong direction. So I fundamentally believe it's related to three things at once. It's social, it's economic, and it's healthcare. Okay. Those things all play into mental health and well-being. So let's just kind of play this out a little bit. Socially, if you look at loneliness, okay, we've seen increases in loneliness across our country. If you look at issues around belonging, 54% of millennials believe that no one can relate to them, that they don't belong. 
okay, that's a social factor and something we have to do something about. Ironically, even though we've got amazing podcasts and we're on Twitter and doing all these things, we're more connected than we've ever been, but we're more disconnected than we've ever been. Second, economical. If we look at you know, the economics, we've got more examples of those that have and those that don't. Okay, the, the increase in inequity and disparities in this country is getting profound and it's not getting better. It's, it's unfortunate because when we look at millennials, they're more likely to be in poverty now than any other demographic. Okay, so how do you have hope and feel like you can live this great, wonderful life when you're up against debt, student loans, whatever it might be? And then there's health care. Okay, we know that most people put off seeking health care because they're afraid they can't afford it. Or if it's a mental health crisis, we know that they're going to have to wait too long. So there was a study that came out last year. 96 million Americans had to wait over one week to get access to a mental health clinician. Now that's actually pretty good one week. The average would be six to 10 weeks. And in some cases, if you're looking at a specialty mental health provider, it could be up to six months. There's something fundamentally flawed about that. So I think all three of those things, you put in a blender and you shake it up, it probably gives you some reason as to why we're seeing those increases in deaths. Wow. Thanks for that. This is going to be a big question, but what are some of the biggest challenges that we as a nation, we as a society are facing t today that is holding us back from transforming the health of our nation and improving the well-being of our citizens and communities. Yeah, okay, let's go with this one. I think it's culture and history. Hmm. We have a culture that treats the mind separate from the body, that treats certain aspects of your physical health as totally okay. Oh, Mike, you hurt your knee, I'm sorry. Versus, oh, Mike, you're obviously sad and depressed, silence. Right. Okay, so we've got this culture that has made it not okay to not be okay. We've got this culture that has really created this, these divides between the mental health and the physical health of all of us. I think that's one piece. Wow. Now, how do you change that? I mean, that's your next question, right? right? Uh, I think it has to do with conversations like this. One of my mentors at the University of Colorado, Larry Green, always taught me that lang language changes culture. So if we believe that the culture that is around health is something different than the language we use, we have to think about different language. So what is that? I think it's health. And we, we typically um, artificially pull out mental health and say, oh, that's its own separate thing, but it's not. So one of my missions, and this is like that punk rocker fallacy in me, is that I believe that we have to redefine the construct of health to make it about the whole of health. I, it's like a great bumper sticker. People are like, what do you mean? What is that even, what are you talking about? But I believe that most of the people out there on the front lines, they know that mental health is a part of their health. They know that where they live is a part of their health. That's health. It's the foundation for achievement. When we change the language around health, we will see a change in the culture. Wow. And I think, in, just like you said, some of the curriculum you guys are doing with Facebook, right, it starts that upstream in, in, our, in our schools, getting to our citizens at an earlier age. I applaud all of that. So, you know, one, one other big thing with this podcast uh, that I shared in episode one is that I want our listening community to be involved. Mm -hmm. I want them to be able to continue to help you on your pursuits at Wellbeing Trust and beyond. So can you share with our listeners one problem, need, or question that the community can help you out with? What are you doing to address mental health in your community? Hmm. Whether that's your home, whether that's the place you work, whether that's where you worship, it doesn't matter where that you get your coffee. What are you doing to address mental health? Are you gonna be like so many others that just turn a blind eye to major needs that people have? Are you going to embrace it and say, this is on me? We're never going to heal as a nation if we don't know how to talk to each other about this. And I believe that all your listeners should, be, should feel this responsibility to do something meaningful around mental health. And it just begins by asking a question. Hey, Mike, how you doing? And be prepared for what the answer is. Because if it's not what you're expecting, if it's not the obligatory, I'm okay. I'm busy. You know, if it's something like it's deeper. Well, you know what? I actually got a lot going on. And let me tell you about what happened while I was in Japan. You need to be prepared for that. All of us need to be prepared for that. And if we do that, your listeners, we will change the world. So to the community out there, please submit uh, your, your answers to Dr. Miller's very important question. Just like he said earlier, it starts with the conversation. It starts with us 
discussing these these needs in our communities and and not separating them from our physical health, right? Thank you for that as well, Dr. Miller. So as before we close out the episode, I always uh, like our, our listeners to be able to connect with you directly on social media. How can they find you on social media? Probably the easiest way is on Twitter. It's what I, I monitor probably more than the sports scores is at Miller7. So those of you that are on Twitter, at Miller7. Excellent. At Miller7 it is. Well, Dr. Miller, thank you for being here today and engaging in an incredibly important conversation and something that's uh, needed now more than ever. I'm honored and humbled to have you on the podcast, and I look forward to continue to see how you are going to reshape the health of our nation moving forward. Thank you. Thank you, Mike. Welcome to the decompression. After some of our interviews, there will be times I will want to spend a few moments with you to discuss what I learned from the experience and some of the action items that were offered. First, remember during the interview, Dr. Miller stated that language changes culture. I couldn't agree more with this assertion, and I want us, including myself, to be able to practice what Dr. Miller taught us. After the interview was complete, Dr. Miller and I were discussing our time together, and he offered a teachable moment for me, which I'm incredibly grateful for. He mentioned the use of the term committed suicide versus died by suicide, and which one is most appropriate for our communities. Dr. Miller said that society typically uses the word committed when passing blame on someone for something they did. For instance, they committed burglary. But with suicide, using the term committed is a blaming statement. Further, if we want people to talk about their feelings around suicide, it can also be extremely stigmatizing to use that term. Thoughts of suicide or even suicide attempts are often grounded in deeper, complex issues, which may include mental illness or even feelings of a loss of identity or belonging. If we truly believe that mental health should be treated the same as physical health, we must be conscious of the language we use that takes away the value-laden judgment of mental illness being a choice. We would never say someone committed cancer, but people die from that all the time. Was it their fault they didn't get better? We must do better helping people, which, as we discussed, begins with being able to help each other. And remember, language changes culture. Thanks for the valuable lesson learned, Dr. Miller. I do appreciate it. Second, Dr. Miller and I look forward to receiving your feedback in regards to this simple yet very powerful question he shared with us during the interview. What are you doing to address mental health in your community? Remember, Dr. Miller believes we won't heal as a nation if we don't know how to talk to each other about mental health. I hope this podcast may be helpful to those that find difficulty in talking about mental health. Finally, please take a moment to review the episode notes to find the links pertinent to Dr. Miller's interview. Also included will be our web form links to submit your feedback to Dr. Miller's question and to nominate other passionate pioneers to be on the podcast, as well as to sign up for our newsletter. Thank you for joining us today on Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli. We'd love to hear your feedback about the podcast so we can continue to improve this community and to further support the pioneers being featured. Lastly, please take a moment to subscribe to the podcast and invite your friends and colleagues to join us. This is Passionate Pioneers with Mike Baselli. I look forward to having you back with us during our next episode.